Uh, I'm here with DJ Zulo, who I can't wait to get his impressions after what we just witnessed. But before I do that, I have to uh, interrupt our regularly scheduled program because the people, the vast majority of the people that are tuning in right now, I would imagine are coming for a basketball post game. We're not doing a post game for a basketball game. We're doing a post game for a boxing match. And my God, to, 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 to DJ, <laughs> we're, we, we come from the same, same place. We remember the 90s. Mm -hmm. If you would have told me throughout the, the, the la most of the last 20 years that there would be a day and a game where I would watch a brand of basketball that would have any, any mantle you want to put any 90s game on, any Knicks Heat game, any Knicks Pacers game, any Knicks Bulls game, and th there would be a game that would come along in the year of our Lord 2024 that would make those other games look at it and be like, oh, shit, we got to share space with, with that now because that was unlike anything I've ever seen before. And I, it, it, I, I have to use the boxing analogy because how else do you take a team like that with the talent that the Sixers have? And we'll talk about that talent and how the Knicks wore it down and how they game planned against it. But without just body blow after body blow after body blow. And eventually that thing got down to the 13th, the 14th, the 15th round. And they were looking for the white towel to be thrown in. They were looking for it. Unfortunately, it never came. They had to play this one out to the end. And my Lord, the effort from this team, this team, this team, this team. And yes, and I'm going to say one more thing and I'm going to throw it to you. I don't know how to talk about this game, Deej, because yes, this is the most special team in some ways. I, I, I'm, I'm starting to, to think crazy thoughts. I, I don't, I don't, like, this team is special and I don't know wh where, where it ranks or whatever. You could watch basketball for a long time and never see like this. I don't know that I've ever seen a team like this and it is a team. It is a capital T team. And yet there was an individual performance at the heart of this game that is also unlike anything we've ever seen. And they both, came in the same game on the same court and they needed both of them to emerge with this win. I am frankly stunned and I am, I'm just in a little bit of shock because I don't know how to reconcile everything that we just witnessed other than to say, Oh my God, this fucking team. I, I'm glad you, you mentioned the nineties because it's, I kept thinking about those teams, those games, and I don't remember those teams just impacting me the same way uh, there. I know it's the first round. I know that in my head, round. I should be, this isn't I, the first, this you, they, I, it's the, it's the first round. It's saying a first, this is not a first round. It, did, it did, hasn't felt like it from the jump in this series. I've never felt this way about a group of players led by their superstar. And he's a goddamn superstar. Capital S, that. capital U, capital For Christ's sake. P. Yeah. They they start the game. Well, they they know right before the game that Mitch is not going to play. There was some thought that he was going to give it a go. He doesn't, he's not able to make it. Boyan Bogdanovich, seconds into entering the game, he's out. Press Achua enters the game <laughs> because Hartenstein got a bunch of fouls in that third quarter. And my God, his defensive performance from the moment he entered that game. Is what is the stuff of, le of legends. It was an incredible defensive performance that is a complete microcosm of what this team is made of, what this team believes in. Next man up. We have enough to win. They are never shook. They don't give an inch. And it starts with the, the guy at the head of it, Jalen Brunson, and it trickles down through every one of those guys. <clears throat> OG Ananobi oh my took God. the Embiid assignment and said, I'm going to beat this man with a metal bat for every second that I'm guarding him, and I'm going to make him, by the end of that game, pull up for a layup because he doesn't have enough energy to dunk that ball. And believe me, that was because A, he didn't, and B, didn't sit in the second half. And the other is, 
Ananobi wouldn't give him a second to breathe. To me, that defensive performance in that fourth quarter is one of the greatest performances by a team on that end I've ever seen. And I've seen greatness on that end since I started watching this team play. It was incredible. The Sixers scored with five minutes and four seconds remaining in the fourth quarter and did not make another field goal after that. Deej, I'm so, they, I'm so, go ahead. They, no, they, no, I, I, they have, we've, I've talked about it on these post games. I think you've, you, you've kind of, I don't know where you are. If you want to, you know, we're going to sit here and do a ranking, but like other than Jokic and Murray, there is a very good argument that this two man game is the most difficult two man game to contain in the NBA right now. And it, it is, it, it is a two man game again, year of our Lord 2024 when the offensive rules have been adjusted. Now, I understand they changed a lot of the foul drawing rules, except those changes don't seem to apply to one guy. And it's the guy that we're playing against in this series. So explain to me, I'm literally asking you, I'm not saying this is not, this is not me asking a, 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 a um, rhetorical, a rhetorical question. I can't yeah. use words right now. Uh, <laughs> this is not a rhetorical question. All right. Explain to me how an unguardable two man combination can go the last five plus minutes of a home playoff game without scoring a field goal without with, with, by the way, with a third string center <laughs> with a third string center playing defense a third string center playing defense and your your wing guarding as good an offensive player as we've seen in in decades um listen the Knicks started the game and they seemed to be Priority number one was to limit the times that Brunson was going to be switched on to Embiid and that they were going to do their best in having their big edge and recover on those high ball screens. Did they and do that me, well? They, they did. And to me, that was the start of building a defensive structure that you can continue through the game. You just They never allowed that two-man game to flourish. And by the time you got to the fourth quarter, and, and listen, it's really hard when you watch it for the first time to really see, you know, in terms of like coverages and and you have to break it down in a second or third watch. But I, it, it, to me, it was a a battle of attrition that the Sixers lost. To me, it, it, I would love to get into the this is the coverage and this is the uh, the strategy. Listen, sometimes it's just one team is tougher than the other one. <laughs> and you know what? You you can't tell me. That you want, you can watch these these games and this one in particular, and say that the 76ers are as tough as these New York Knicks because they are not. And on top of that, we have Jalen Brunson, who deserves every flower, every bit of gratitude. We, he deserves to be celebrated because to do that on a hostile environment, getting beat up and thrown to the ground, jumped on, fallen on by a 300 pound behemoth, and he still came and. Listen, it wasn't perfect, but he was an absolute rock solid, built of iron, strong willed competitor who can just make shots like few can. And that's I, why the Knicks are, that's why they won this game. I think, look, last season, well, it's, it's, it's been in stages, right? It's like the playoff series against Donovan Mitchell when Brunson was in uh, uh, Dallas and, uh, Donovan Mitchell was in Utah. That was like the opening salvo. Last season was the the real full throated announcement. Like I'm here, you, mm-hmm. you're going to have to take me seriously. And then this past season has been okay. Now, whatever you thought of me last year, you're going to need to recalibrate that. But even with what he did this season, you don't attain the sort of legend status that he is. I mean, I don't know what else he needs to do. I mean, this, the, the, what we saw tonight, go go find your best, quote unquote, small guy playoff performances from NBA history. You know, go find your Isaiah Thomas games. Go find your Steve Nash games. Go find your Allen Iverson games. Like it, 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 it and I just named two guys that won MVPs and another guy that is, I don't know, conservatively speaking, one of the 30 greatest players of all time. Yeah, one of the greatest clutch players of all time. Um, this th- this goes toe to toe with any of them. I mean, I'm just, I'll just I have to want to read the stat line: forty seven points on eighteen of thirty four from the field. He did this, by the way, without having his three ball tonight. He was two of eight from three, and he I think he realized he didn't have the three ball 
because it, it, it like you t- tell me if you feel the same way, you know, when Brunson's feeling it from three mm-hmm. and I don't, I never got the sense that he was really feeling it from three in this game. Yeah. I mean, there are some of these looks are really good and it, it's, it's shots. He typically is, he's making, yeah. I think he had one uh, catch and shoot from the corner. That one, especially, which he, he ended up um, drawing short on, which is a yep. shot that he has made time and time again, you know, high percentage look for him. So yeah, I agree with you. Did not have his typical three point look to supplement like all his within the the three point line scoring. So 47 points uh, on 34 shots, 10 assists. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this. Mm. One turnover. <laughs> One turnover. I did not even see that. And that's incredible. <laughs> One turnover running the Knicks offense for 44 minutes and for, and 44 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like that is, I mean, we get, let's okay. So here, we're, here it is. It's, it's the greatest playoff performance in Nick history. That's well, it. in terms of uh, scoring the ball. It's, it is literally the number one scoring yeah, ball. It, 47 points is the most that any Nick has ever scored in a playoff game. It's the first time any Nick has gone 40 points and 10 assists in a playoff game. I've done a lot of analyzing and breaking down and how, especially after game two of like, how can they figure out a way to just get him some space, some better looks. How, what can he do better? And look, I didn't think, I thought the first quarter, the Sixers would probably come out of that 12 points on nine field goals attempts, seven jump shots. I thought he was a good first quarter, but I did not think he was, he was dominating the game, but they would take that right. They, because he was working. So yeah, the Sixers would take that. Everything. Absolutely. And then the second quarter hits and all of a sudden he is getting deeper in the paint. Paul Reed enters the game. And to me, that's been a, a little bit of a subplot here is whenever Paul Reed has entered the game, the Jalen Brunson heart and sign two man game flourishes. Brunson is able to get deeper paint touches. He gets a rhythm and his passing just jumped off the page in that second quarter. to get six assists to go along with 11 points in the second and dominated the game. And he, and he was off and running. So, and Reed minus me, minus six in four minutes, we should say for Embiid. No, uh, Reed, Paul Reed, minus oh, six Paul Reed. four minutes. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yep. I mean, and, and it was, you felt that. And I'm sure that was part of the reason why uh, Nick Nurse did not take out Embiid in that uh, second half. And I, I next, look, we're going to talk about Jalen Brunson for the rest. I'm gonna, I'll be here until uh, midnight talking about Jalen Brunson. So it's not that I don't want to give him his attention. He's going to get a lot of attention tonight. But I want to mm-hmm. move on to the rest of this performance. And I'm going to... So you so four minutes for Paul Reed doing the math, and that's where it shows up. Forty four minutes for Joel Embiid. Look, putting all the Embiid stuff aside, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take the high road here, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go with any of the I'm not gonna talk about any of the other stuff. What I will say though is, you and if it if I if it looks like I'm wearing a Tom Thibodeau mask for what I'm about to say. That's because I am. You don't prepare for games like this in April or March or January or December. You prepare for games like this in September and August and July and with your with your work over the summer. And the thing with that's different, and this and this is why half of NBA players say. Yeah, they might do some winning over there in New York. F that. Mm-hmm. I want nothing to do with that. You know why? I'm a professional goddamn athlete. I'd like to enjoy my life a little bit. Well, guess what? When you come here, it's a year-round job. And if you're not effing ready to play on day one or as ready to play on day, day 82 or 92 or 102 game whatever as you are on game one, you're not, that you're not going to play. And I'm not I'm not throwing any shade at Joel Embiid because Joel Embiid's in good company. Most of the league would wear down, down the stretch if they played 40 minutes, especially at his size. This team is built differently. They are, they are made of different. You, you t- tweeted it. It's the best tweet I've seen. They are made out of, I got to curse one more time. Sorry to my cab driver friend. They're made of fucking iron. They are made of iron and they don't know how to wear down. It's not an option because their coach won't let it be an option. Now, they have to endorse that, but that is what that's what it is. You're 100 percent right. And listen, I don't know if there's a stat that doesn't put the spotlight on that. They had five second uh, chance points the Knicks in the first half. They only had ten through three uh, three quarters. They had eleven in the fourth quarter, and every it seemed like every shot they missed, and they missed a lot of them in that quarter. They 
were either getting that ball or they were knocking it off a 76er or they were doing every rebound the Sixers were attempting to grab on the defensive end was an absolute adventure because the Knicks with Hartenstein not even in the game were just relentless led by Josh Hart, led by Precious Achua, led by OG Ananobi. This is a, his rebounding uh, on both sides. The best rebounding performance he's had as a Nick, one of the best I've ever seen him put forth as an NBA player. I didn't know he was because, capable of it. Listen, they put Josh Hart to start the game on Maxi. Good adjustment. Let o- OG roam, and he had three, at least three stops in the first half defending uh, Embiid going to the basket, uh, d- uh, sh- either shot blocks or affecting the shot. And listen, he's going to be closer to the basket. Josh Hart is not going to be there as, as close, so you're going to have to s- make up that difference. And he did it. And just you have to end possessions with defensive rebounding. It's underrated. And he was a huge part on that end. And then his defense on, and- on Embiid in the second half, incredible i have not seen a player of that size defend that man that well i can't rem- i can't Ever. remember maybe it's in another og and an ob game when he was a raptor i can't think of another game where it's a wing I'm, has there been a draymond him. game maybe maybe uh, but you know draymond is like a you know he's a pseudo like center big um and Obi, he's a wing he's a big wing that just you brought him in here because of his versatility and the switch on that Tibbs made to take him off Maxi and allow him to roam uh, as a defender in the first half. And then to be able to go to him as your Embiid stopper in the second half. Listen, I, you, you can talk about other defenders being in Ananobi's category or some guys being better than him, but in terms of versatility, in terms of like how you could use him, there's no one better on that side of the ball in the league than him. And he proved it tonight in as big a stage as you can prove it in. If you told every NBA coach in the league that this was that the if you described this game situation to a T Mm -hmm. and you're like, you get one guy to put in this role to do this thing. I I have to think the vast majority, if not every NBA coach, be like, all right, yeah, I'll take OG. Yeah, because, you know, I know he could do it. The, the, The possession there where it was on the on the right side of the court where he was fronting Embiid and just wouldn't he just wouldn't let him get the ball. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was it was Maxi there, and Maxi was trying. Maxi just couldn't. He couldn't even hit out the ball to him. Listen, like, sometimes when you have a yeah. small on you, you could get your left forearm in there, and you could push out, and you can get a little bit of a space to get that ball over the top. But it, he wouldn't allow him to generate any space between himself and Embiid. And then it's that pass over the top with backline help. That's another aspect. Josh Hart as a backline defender has he ever been better? So you can I ask you some, Go ahead. something else? D- sorry. W- so two things I want to get. I, I'm re- I know we're not. This is not an X's and O's. I'm jumping around game. and I apologize. No, I, no. But I, I so have, many. <laughs> I have so you and I want to utilize you because I yeah. don't. Here's the thing. I don't know how to talk about the performance and the toughness and the grit without at least touching on the X's and O's. So the, the first thing I want to ask you, Embiid was not or excuse me, OG was not on Maxi. That in order to survive that. That was just guys digging deep, right? Yeah. It, 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 like, it, and it was like you said, it was hard. But I thought also Brunson, like Brunson's defensive performance tonight versus, and you yeah. called it out. Credit to you, man, because everybody like me was out there yelling and screaming about all the Embiid nonsense. And you're like, look, Brunson's got to be better on defense. Like you yeah. cut the roll of the bush. You said the thing that needed to be said, and he did. And I thought he was today, right? He was. I thought him, and then it's to me, it was Brunson, and it was what you're asking your bigs to do. And it's a lot to ask of them to come out and hedge on that maxi screen and then yes. get all the way yes. back to and be that's a tough chore to do. Think about the space that maxi, as he flattens that pick and roll as that, he flattens that once that screen set, he's flattening out because all he wants to do is generate as much space between him and Embiid, who's popping out to the three point line. Now the end game, the last game, it was Brunson where Lowry was in the slot trying to, take away that Embiid pass, and then he's, he's caught between a rock and a hard place. Yep. The yep. Knicks adjusted by telling Hartenstein or whoever uh, Precious to get back to Embiid. That's what, that's what we, we cannot have. These switches, these mismatches, it killed us, and we're not going to let it happen again. And to me, that's another. And we always talk about, you know, with Tibbs and, you know, what kind of coach is he in a playoffs. He's, he made two massive playoff adjustments in this game that if you can't look any – you can't analyze this game anymore and not talk about the the Ananobi off Maxi. Let him roam and get your bigs to get back to Embiid and, and limit some of those open catch and shoot threes that Embiid was getting with fluidity in that third quarter the last time these two teams played. Um, and then down the stretch of the fourth quarter, I thought there were 
three, four, five possessions where they were defending on a string in terms of the switching and, and, or just like getting like help and recover. Like mm, yes. the next guy recovers, the next guy recovers, the next guy recovers, the next guy recovers. Like I'm thinking back to, um, yeah, I, a, a podcast that I was listening to like a year, a couple a year or two ago. I don't know why this just popped into my head, but it was Brian Scalabrini talking uh, to Zach Lowe about the Celtics and how the Celtics are unstoppable when they just always make the next pass. Mm-hmm. And like the Sixers team, to their credit, I thought in the fourth quarter on a lot of possessions before things start, before the Knicks wore them down, was really doing a great job making the next pass. And it just didn't matter because it was just a Nick there every time the ball moved. Nick's there. Ball moved. The Nick is there. I, I mean, the amount of, what does that take? I mean, it takes obviously digging deep, but just concentration. Yes. That's, Concentr- that's, that's just in, ingrained in you at this point. It's all those things. And also, if you think about the players that closed that game, McBride, Josh Hart, McBride, and Anobi, McBride tonight. Yes. Achua. These guys not only dig deep, they're not only on a string. They have athleticism and agility, speed, athletic ability to make those rotations and not be blown by on a closeout, not get destroyed when a team is getting downhill or getting or giving up a mismatch and 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 not holding your own. It was that group on a, on the defensive end. My God, because maybe part of it is Embiid was wearing down and just didn't want to be there anymore, or whatever the case was. But they, that was physicality met with agility, met with determination, met with almost elite athletic ability to get around and move and be in the right spot and not get exposed when you're in rotation, which typically is what happens when the Sixer team is flowing. They're in rotation. You are having a close out. You're getting two to the ball. You're in trouble. And then you have breakdowns. They didn't have breakdowns in that quarter. Because of the personnel, because of the coaching, because of the players they had out there. I mean, just it was, I, I can't wait to go back and watch it because it's one of the best defensive quarters I've seen in a, in a big game. It says, I, I, can, I, can't remember, I can't remember one that would be a close second, to be honest with you, in years. I have incredible. I, again, game. So it, w- w- with like, we're not talking about games against the Pistons in February. Like, I'm, um, you no, know, a, a big game moments in- against yeah. a really a team that can do some damage and, and just really disrupt what you're trying to do defensively. Um, you always talk about you, you're, on, you're on top of the complicated stuff and then you're on top of the simple things that get lost between the cracks. You always talk about things like winning the closeout, yeah. you know, and how winning the closeout, winning the closeout could win basketball games. And like that, like, again, th- that fourth quarter doesn't happen if, if, if there's not just one person because everybody needs to win their closeout because the first person who does win the closeout, then the chain breaks. Yes. You know? Thank you. And, yes. And then, and then we, and, and we haven't even talked about how many plays at the rim were there where somebody oh, wow. came up with a massive bl- between Josh Hart. Yes. I mean, the Josh Hart. Bl- so like, I don't know. How, block on Batum. The block on Batum. The, the I mean, block on it, and um, he had a couple. OG had at least one big one, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and pre- and then the precious. We got we uh, give credit to precious also for that last miss by Embiid. Precious was there. I mean, yep. he at least made him. He challenged him. You know, well, three the Sixers in the fourth quarter, three of ten in the restricted area. My, three of ten. Is that real? Three of ten. I'm looking three at it right of now. Ten in the restricted area. So that's obviously within the charge circle. That's you don't. And that to me, there was some, I'm, I'm sure you could find a, just a, a smoked layup out of that. But if I'm trying to replay that quarter in my head, that was a lot of like s- multiple hands on the ball and Nick's either knocking oh, it out or getting underneath uh, the, the sixer player trying to finish and just disallowing easy layup attempts or dunk attempts at the rim. But DJ, why does someone smoke a layup? Cause they're uncomfortable. Yeah. There you go. You know, um, there's no team in the league. There's no team in the league that is better at making you uncomfortable than the Knicks. The Knicks, like, they won this game. I don't know if this is going to make any sense. You talk about, like, well, did, did this team win the game or did this other team lose the game? They won this game because they forced Philadelphia to lose this game with what they were doing mm-hmm. to Philadelphia. Because if you look at this fourth quarter, and there were there were some big makes, but like, man, I'm afraid to look. How many how many field goals did the Knicks make in the last like seven, eight, nine minutes of this game? It doesn't seem like there were many. 
you know, was, like they got yeah. to the free throw line and, and oh my God, Josh, <laughs> I love you, Josh. Please don't do that to me ever again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, the Knicks were six of 21 in the quarter. There you go. In the fourth, so, so it's yeah. like, this wasn't a game where the Knicks came into Philadelphia and hit big shot after big shot in the fourth quarter to steal this one. Mm-hmm. They, like this was this was by force of will. They were the to go back to the analogy I started with. They were the last man standing, and that's all this was. How tough are you? Yeah, and I, I just the the Brunson stuff. Listen, I know there it got things got stagnant in the fourth quarter, and there's a lot of isolations, which he did. I thought play. You, you're going to get some isolation attempts, and listen to playoffs. Sometimes you just have to make shots when you're heavily contested and it's the things are bogged down. He missed some in the fourth quarter. There was not much going on. And I will just a mea culpa on my part, because I was like, we need Hartenstein back in the game just to inject some flow, some creativity into this fourth quarter, which seemed to be a, a slog for the Knicks. And it was, but, but did, I can thought, I ask you? Did, yeah. I thought Brunson, when there were good opportunities to give it up, he gave it up. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was just like there was no, there were no moments no for him to give it up because sure. it just seemed like yeah. things they were spreading the floor and he was it was a lot of Tobias Harris one on one and he listen, I'm sure there's shots there that he typically is going to make, but to me, it wasn't they they weren't your optimal shot attempts in the fourth sure. quarter. But that listen, that is what this is, right? You we, we've started this by talking about the '90s and those teams. Rarely would you get clean looks. Rarely would you have a nice oh. offensive set that was flowing. You get a back cut or like you get yes. an open three. Back That'll back. happen one through three uh, quarters. But in the fourth quarter, it was not happening. Credit the Sixers. I thought they did a good job in that quarter uh, defensively. But to stick with Achua there and keep Hartenstein on the bench, who just struggled with Embiid. And listen, if you're going to bring Hartenstein back in the game, maybe you want to, and rightfully so, you're probably going to want to keep OG on the Embiid matchup. And then you're going to have to figure yeah. out, is that mean Hartenstein's guarding Ubre, and, th- and that complicates things. So credit to tips for making a decision. I, w- I wouldn't have made, but was the correct one because the Chua was that dominant defensively because, and it started early for him because on those maxi drives, which he's gotten a lot of good stuff out of getting downhill, a Chua from the time he entered the game from until the time he left was stifling those drives and making those shots over a contest without fouling. I thought he's he defended Maxi phenomenally in that game. And just, it was a great defensive play uh, a game for a player that had just always been there for this team. And it's never pretty. He missed a ton of layups, the dunk attempt that he missed. I, but, yeah, it was, there was a couple at the rim that were like the start yeah. of the fourth quarter. Those two would at the beginning of the fourth. I was like, Oh my God, pressure's going to kill me. I know. Um, we'll come back to bite us. To but, one of those things. But look, and, and then as the last thing I'm saying, then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, stick around for the first couple post game segments and, and sure. then we'll get you out of here. Um, I remember the conversation you and Benji had a few months ago about is precious someone that like needed to be a part of the rotation, no matter what, or is he just an elite depth piece? Mm. And it was great. You had a great back and forth about it. And he kind of like, he exists in that in between zone. Like he's, it's very clear that he is good enough on, in the right situation on the right team to be a rotation player on a team that is looking to do really serious things. But on this team, on this team, that situation was not there for him. Once they got Mitch back, Mm -hmm. For that dude <clears throat> to stay ready after he went out there and was like averaging 40 minutes a game for mm-hmm. whatever it was, two, three, four weeks. Yep. And then to be ready to come in. And in this moment, like, man, I don't think I don't the Knicks have a lot of stuff in the air with the center position this summer. Uh, so it may not be then. But some teams should invest in pressure Sachua because that's a guy I think you would just want in your you, you want him in your program. I think so. And you know, there were, at one point in the fourth quarter, I just wrote down Nick's rebounding everything. And it felt oh, like they were rebounding everything. everything. And it was a lot of it was him. Yeah. And there was one play even in the first half where I was stunned by it. He holds and beat off with his left arm and gets an offensive rebound. Like he was literally holding a guy that's probably 30, 40 pounds bigger, uh, heavier than him. And just with his left sh- forearm, <laughs> Wouldn't let him move I, and then I remember grab the, the offensive rebound. I remember the play. Remember the play you're talking about. I mean, he is, he's got a, he just, he's just 
part and parcel with what this team does, what the team believes in. Uh, I, it's, I feel like there's, it trickles down from the coach and you said it about preparing in July, you prepare in August, September, and those games where a lot of, you know, if you're in the national media, why is Tibbs playing all those guys? Why, what, what is he, why is he grinding them so hard this early in the season? Where, how, what are they going to be come playoff time? What were they come playoff time? Ladies and gentlemen, this quarter, this, that's what this. they were. And that you cannot credit this team, these players, without crediting the head coach who doesn't allow them to not be this way. It's not perfect, but it's who they are. It's their identity. It's their culture. And I couldn't be prouder of them. Could not be prouder of them. And, 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 and the front office for recognizing what the assignment is here. Yep. And how you go about attaining success. If this is if this is the direction you wanted to go with this head coach, which you know, anybody who's watched this show before knows that I have always been not my favor of. But if you're going to go in that direction, be, be all in. Don't half-ass it. You know, um, I'm with you. And it, before I forget, can I I mention please the DiVincenzo moments? It was seventy to sixty-three to the in the uh, third. The, Forgotten, they will they will be forgotten they, from this game. I and they shouldn't I, be. They shouldn't be. He makes a three to make it seventy to sixty six. Makes another one to make it seventy to sixty nine. Back to back threes. Listen, when you're when when shooting when making shots is a premium, they can come in the third quarter and they could be some of the biggest shots in the game. I thought the Boyan shots in in uh, game two were like that, Same where thing. they just had a different weight to them. Those two Divincenzo. Uh, threes in that third quarter to me were massive because it was danger zone. That was danger zone time. There was. was a world. There was a world where those don't go down mm-hmm. and Phil, and maybe Philly scores one there. It's all of a sudden, oh shit, we're down by 12 here and right. we've played this hard. Maybe it's not on their huge shots. Um, Massive for, for him. <laughs> the Knicks won again. Oh my God, this is it. the Knicks win a game on the road. Uh, when they shoot seven of twenty-seven from three, twenty-five point nine percent. I don't think they've won many games this year when they've shot that low a uh, percentage-wise. I'll look it up at some point. Um, and and Fred, tw- uh, I'm going to steal this from Fred Katz, uh, who tweeted not this exact thing earlier, but something to this effect. Tells you everything you need to know about the New York Knicks, where a guy who he's not the player of the game because player of the game set the franchise record for most points in playoff game, but there's a there's an argument that he's right there with Ananobi. And precious for like the, the second most important guy in, in this game. And that's Josh Hart. Mm. 46 minutes, did not make a field goal, took seven shots, missed seven shots. And yet the man has a genuine argument for having been the second most impactful Nick in this game. That does not compute. It does not reconcile with anything that we know about basketball. Again, in the year of our Lord, tw- you can get away with that shit in 1993, <laughs> or 1995, <laughs> or 2003, right? right? You can't, it's not something you get away, but they can get away with it because of everything else um, that they do. And also playing pretty much the entire, most of the game with five fouls. Uh, and he, and he, and he stayed on the floor. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, okay. Beach. Yes. <laughs> yes, if sir. You're, man, it just like, how great was that game? Cause I know they won. There was a, there was a point. Gotta in get one more. Quarter. Go ahead. Talk for thirty five minutes. You got to got to get one more, and it Go won't ahead. be it won't be easy. No, it's all. I just got to get one more. It won't be easy. I just want to say that. Just saying that. <laughs> I feel obligated to say it. Yeah, listen. It, there's fewer games are ever going to impact me that in that, and then you too, I imagine, where it just you leave it out there. I'll remember this for the rest of my life. And the team that you're playing is doing the same thing into the end. And where it's like the energy bar for the Sixers was just decreasing ever so slightly faster than the Knicks. And by the end of it, the Knicks had a little left in the tank and the Sixers run empty. Yeah. And well, that's what this team does. We're going to find out what the Sixer team is made of in game five um, with how they come out and how they're able to sustain their effort and what they got. Um, but that is a topic conversation for another day. Let us move on to our first couple post game segments, uh, which DJ is going to hang around for. Uh, first and foremost, our autograph player of the game. Uh, download the autograph app and use code KFS 
and get rewarded for your Knicks fandom. You have heard us talk a lot about Autograph recently. We're so excited to be partnered with them through the playoffs. Um, we did a, a great spot the other day with someone from Autograph. Uh, it talked uh, uh, about a lot of things, but talked about the app. Um, yeah, go download it. Poke around. Um, you're going to, again, win win cool stuff. They just gave away a Deuce jersey um, for like $2. Uh, they're doing stuff like that all the time. So Autograph, player of the game. Again, use code KFS. Get rewarded for your Knicks fandom. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a, the, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna take the easy road here because I'm gonna go first. <laughs> and you know who I'm gonna give to the, you know, player of the game to? Tom I'm Thibodeau. The- <laughs> 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 um, I'm gonna give it to, uh, a, a man who is, is he 27 years old? Jalen? Yeah, it seems right. Sounds right, right? Yeah, maybe. Like, he's- about to be 28, but close. Yeah, whatever. Like, we could. This, it, I'm not saying it's, it could get that. I mean, I don't think it could get that much better, but like, we, we might be in for this for a while. Like, this is, I mean, I've said it before about him. It's, it's, it's why you watch, it's why you watch sports. You, you hope that a team that you root for at some point is graced with a player like this, a person like this someone who you can watch and never like fandom is as I talk about all the time on the show like fandom fandom can be a dicey thing because your your natural emotion when someone is not performing is to start to be like man can't come on you could do better than that like Mm. Jalen Brunson is so good they're like, yeah, he missed some shots in the fourth quarter, but like he has attained a, le- a status, or at least he, he should, and I think he yeah. has. Where every every person who watches this team and every person who root for this team, he can do no wrong. And that's not to say that we're dummies for for like, oh, you know, he walks on water. No, you have to earn that, and to earn that status in New York, like, not many, not many people ever get there in any sport. Mm. And he's gotten to that point um, because everybody knows no one puts more into their craft than him. And I think you saw that on the national stage um, in, uh, I don't know if it was the biggest game of his career so far, but it was right up there. So I'll give it to Jalen Brunson and I'm going to toss the baton to you. You know, you only get to pick one. Listen, I, I've talked about him already, but the Knicks obviously it's not saying anything groundbreaking. They don't win the game without OG and an OB. Okay. I'm both ends. You were going. I'm both ends of the court. Uh, I thought in the first half, he was some of the drives uh, down, down the lane with Embiid uh, defending a little, you know, I would have liked a little more um, diversity in some of the finishes and maybe look to kick that ball out. He was attacking though. And I thought, you know, the Knicks empowered him a little more in this game to try to make some plays with the ball. And I thought for the most part, did a good job. His two point field goal percentage was really good. Didn't make a lot of threes, but to me, it's, it's where he shined was on the defensive end and Embiid ended up having 13 points in the second half. Um, to, I, I I'd have to go back to, it. I think a lot of those were on Hartenstein fouls that he ended up getting at the free throw line. I, I don't re- recall Embiid getting any kind of rhythm with MB with the OG guarding him. So to me, you cut Embiid down to the, a, a peg or two and he's a mortal player. <laughs> you don't win the game if you don't do that. And, and it was a rough Hartenstein def- game defensively in that third quarter, yeah. especially that was rough. For OG to come to take that assignment and just not quite dominate and beat, but make every touch an absolute adventure to the point where by the time he got the ball, imagine the energy he expended just getting the positioning, just kept by catching the ball. You don't. But OG is expending that same energy. He is right. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> and, and, and then if you watch him and this has not been something he's built a career on crashing the glass time after time on the offensive end, watch OG and Obi, watch this game again and just see, watch him crash every single time in the fourth quarter. The Sixers had no shot because it's seven, two OG wingspan, OG and Obi, Josh Hart and pressures Achua. motors that wouldn't end. In the fourth quarter of a game, they were all playing exceptionally high minutes. Hard minutes. 
hard minutes and that's it goes to go back to it you build that in august you build that in september not like i've never heard you April. like this this is like <laughs> just, this is so special to be able to hear you because it's a it's yeah. a to me it's a blend because you're you're all about the x's and o's but you said it at the top. This like, yeah, this game is about X's and O's, right? Like Benji just had a, a good tweet about the adjustments that Tibbs made and everything. Mm. This was this wasn't an X's and O's win. This is a this was a it's want not, it. I just and I want to revel in it. I want to let it soak in. I'll get yeah. you know the breakdowns and the analysis will come and yeah. but just celebrate this no, win, folks. Be proud please of you. be proud, be of, proud you, of these everybody. guys. Incredible, um, incredible win. All right, uh, let's get our next segment done, and then I'm going to get DJ out of here. Um, the Unified Healing Road to Recovery. <laughs> My God, what are we? We're, this is going to be interesting. You got about 15 to, minutes for this one, right? <laughs> the rest of the show. Yeah. Go to Unified Healing. That is U N I F Y D Healing dot com to learn more and find a center near you. Um, so, uh, all right, let's let's. So Mitchell Robinson was uh, listed as questionable uh, in this game. There was an interesting Woj report before the game that seemed to suggest that Mitch was going to give it a go. Meanwhile, Steve Popper, who uh, always always trust the beat guys, folks, uh, looked at Mitch come out and it was like, yeah, he, he don't, he's not out yet. And then when he was out there, he didn't look right. He looked frustrated. Uh, Mitch didn't give it a go. I would wow. imagine that he will obviously try to give it a go. I mean, if he almost if he if he was game time decision for this one, I would imagine he's going to give it a try to really hard to give it a go yeah. for game five. Um, and for as amazing as Precious was, like if they could get the version of Mitch that we've seen at times in the series, most especially game one, uh, that'll be a a, a boon. Um, Boyan Magdanovic, uh, again, uh, was a Batum that landed on his ankle. Yeah, it was. And uh, we went back to the locker room. Was uh, listed as questionable, and then they ruled him out. No idea what's going on there and can I okay here I'm going to ask you quickly we don't have to spend a lot of time on this how much did they miss bogey in this game That's because the question. defense is what win, won them the game it's lost a little bit yeah. yeah um I don't I don't have a great answer for you now I'll okay uh, that's that's something no, I just I, I want to go back to that because it never, it didn't stand. I'm sure there are points in the fourth quarter, but he hasn't really been like a heavy minute fourth quarter player for this team. I I, I don't know if it, it if it felt like a bogey game in terms of like what they sure needed yeah. in that fourth quarter. But he's he's an important shot maker for this team, and, and you know maybe it was like the Divincenzo threes that we we talked about. I think Deuce had you have two or or one in the Deuce was the three round. of five. Did he, three of five. Okay. Three of five from three in this game. Four or seven overall. He's again, like, I'm happy you brought up the DiVincenzo shots. They're going to be lost in the shuffle. Deuce, 27 minutes, 13 points on seven shots, um, four rebounds. Big just, he just fits like a glove with what this team this is, is all about. Yeah. He's a freaking six man on this team. Yeah. It's wild. Who's, I he, didn't, I, there are people who saw this coming or who claim <laughs> that they saw this coming. I did not see this coming. No, and you know what? He said it a few times. Tom Thibodeau saw it coming, and he just—he <laughs> knew it was going to be a matter of time. So, uh, credit to him. Credit to to Deuce. He just—he—he he, there was points late late in the season, midway through maybe that he just looked uh, ill equipped for the job they were going to ask him to be like the backup point guard. And he's not your prototypical backup point guard, but he's handled it enough. And done a good enough job to where I am pleasantly surprised based on where he was earlier in the season, handling the ball against ball pressure and just just getting them into some semblance of offense. But then, but it's the shooting, right? That's the the thing that is a complete game breaker for and the penetration what too. Needs. Yeah, the fact that he can at least he doesn't get all the way to the rim, but he doesn't need to mm -hmm. because that midi seems like it's oh. He scrapes the the arena ceiling when he shoots it, but it is like a, a 12 pure footer. shot. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> he really shoots it in a way that there are very few guys in the league that do it like him. He's it's he's, wild. He, there's a uniqueness to him that is pretty fascinating with that. His in and a confidence games. and, a, and confidence. a confidence. You you're not listen, man. There's a lot of there's a lot of personalities on this on this roster. Like you, you're Josh Hart's, and obviously Brunson's the leader, and everybody. Like he comes in, he he doesn't think twice. 
He's yeah. like, listen, man, I, the coach, because, and that's the other thing. Like, I, I don't want to make this about Tom Thibodeau again, but there have been so many complaints over the years about Tom Thibodeau not empowering young players and holding young players back. Listen, if you're a young player and you come in the gym and you do what Tibbs asks you to do, he will give you the freaking greenest of green lights in the history of coaching. And if you miss he it, he doesn't care because he cares about the process. And he'll tell you, at, at, if you ask him about it in the post game, they're good shots, right? They're good shots. He puts in the work, they're good shots. That's all he cares about. It, that's it. And a lot of players, even if they're not on the team anymore, that are going to get paid a lot of money and they they owe their star, their foundation that was built here. It's quickly. That's RJ getting paid. I mean, these guys, it, it is not just the players on the team. Like he is a, I think it's a, a misnomer that he's somehow stifles young players. If you, like you said, if you put in the work and that, it goes back to like some of the comments he's made about guys, maybe not doing that. And then that's why you're missing shots in, in games. But he is, if you show him you're putting in the work, he will empower you. And it's a, it's a great point. And Deuce is just, he is a, he is, he perfectly embodies that, that uh, belief that the coach has. Well said. Uh, we should also just mention there was a brief scary moment where Jalen Brunson went back to the locker yeah. room after he, I think he landed on a maybe defensive possession or planted on a defensive possession or something and seemed, uh, something seemed to be bothering maybe. His yeah. Hip. And the lower, the lower last second three in the third quarter seemed yes. to like bump his knee or I don't know if it was a lower, it was an ankle or, but luckily he, he came right back out because obviously with the way this team is going on the injury front, I was, I was thinking the worst, like, are we going to lose this guy? for this last quarter, but thank, thankfully he came back and seemed well, like he was, he was fine. Like, well, I don't know if I, we'll, we'll see if, if yeah. he's, and you know what, if he's not fine, he's not going to let anybody know. And he's certainly yeah. not going to use it as an excuse. Um, and we should also say regarding bogey uh, report before the game that something's wrong. He got an MRI. Something's wrong with his wrist. Chris mm-hmm. Persiana, our own Chris Persiana yes. reported this a few weeks ago. Good job by him. Uh, he's going to get some kind of procedure done in the off season, but he's going to tough it out for the time being. We'll see if the ankle allows him to get, um, on the court to tough out the wrist thing. Uh, everybody's banged up. Yep. Everybody's mm-hmm. banged up. You know, um, doesn't matter. It's uh, no one. No one's going to feel as the Knicks said, no one's going to feel sorry for us. You know, right. we, we got to go out and win it. Um, last thoughts, DJ, before I let you go. Well, I think, I think the last thing is, and uh, there's a lot of talk about like, how are they going to respond to the Embiid stuff? There is no hard foul. There is no, I'm going to send a message physically or to the point where I'm going to, uh, you know, there was no message to, uh, needed to be sent that was above and beyond how they were behaving on the court with just the basketball game. And to me, that's where the message was sent. The message was sent by just not giving that man who listen, we, we have every right to feel that he stepped, he crossed the line in game three. Damn right. we, I'm listen, you want to feel like you need to send a message and like, you know, knock him on the ground or like put him on his ass and all that. But you just, the message that you send him is that you are going to beat him on the court every second that he's on there and not give him, give him an inch. And to me, the Knicks did that. And that's the ultimate message. And they, they sent it loud and clear and we'll see how, uh, how game five is going to turn out. I'm sure the, the building is going to be on fire and I can't wait to, can't wait to, uh, to see it. DJ, this was um, awesome to have you here. I, think, uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased to be on with you. I Andrew texted me late last night. He's like, you want me to ask DJ if he wants to come on with you? I was like, yes, because <laughs> win yeah. or lose, I'm going to be ill-equipped to talk about the adjustments and X's and O's and things of this game. Yeah, And I'm so happy that you were able to come on and um, give just a very extraordinarily necessary context to the effort that we saw because it's it's that's again that's the thing it's it's you need you need it all like mm-hmm. and they they brought everything to a game that was really one of the better basketball games I think you'll ever see so I agree thank great you to have you here for uh this one man DJ I'll talk to you soon yes um, sir Godspeed sir take care <laughs>